All right, welcome everybody. Um, we have a CephFS talk, and we have two of us of the CephFS core contributors, Jeff and Patrick. So please welcome them and enjoy the talk. Hi, everybody. This is a talk about some work I've been uh, working on for the last uh, year or so. Uh, it's still quite bleeding edge, so be gentle. Um, so first of all, I'll go ahead, go in. Oh, yeah, sorry, let me apologize for this Firefox browse the web thing. Yay, Fedora. Um, so anyway, uh, just a little bit about us. Um, I'm longtime kernel dev. Uh, I've done some uh, move to doing uh, recent work with uh, Ceph, and just recently took over uh, maintainership of uh, KCFFS. Zhang wanted to move on to doing more work in the MDS, and so I've taken over that part of it. Uh, and Patrick is uh, uh, also a, a contributor or, or a, a lead uh, person on CephFS these days and uh, joined Red Hat in 2016. And uh, he mostly shepherds the project along at this point. So anyway, uh, what motivated this work is uh, uh, the real, you know, the you know, sort of the truism that anytime you're working with a network file system, you know, NFS, CIF, Ceph, anything like that, uh, Metadata directory operation directory operations generally are pretty slow. Um, uh, you know, if you're doing an open, an unlink, rename, anything like that, you al almost always are doing a round trip, synchronous round trip to the server. So we, we'll, you know, someone will call into the kernel, uh, we'll dispatch an RPC to the server, uh, and then we have to wait for the reply to come in, and then finally we can return back to user land. Those are slow. Uh, so this affects a whole lot of different workloads. You know. You know, your untarring files, you know, rsync, uh, you know, anytime you're removing a big directory tree, um, and also stuff like compiling software, you know, basically anything you do that touches a file system is going to be affected by that. Um, so, you know, first is, you know, why, first of all, is why are local file systems so much faster? Well, the obvious thing is that they don't have a server to talk to, right? You know, they don't have to make this long round trip. Um, and then there's also some journal, non-journal file systems uh, that buffer their metadata mutations in memory. Uh, so like, th these are stuff like ext2. Um, not so much in use these days. It, but in most journal file systems, the journal's pretty quick. Uh, and so you know, we don't tend to worry too much about uh, the fact that we have to journal all this data in order to handle the uh, crash recovery. So the consequences of that is that you, know, you can, uh, uh, they can, you know, batch out the rights to the journal. Uh, so you can do, do a whole bunch of, you can build basically a transaction and then flush it out to the journal. Um, but those operations are not guaranteed to be, uh, not all, you know, especially when you're dealing with these non-journal file systems, uh, the operations that you do are not guaranteed to be durable unless you F-sync. Uh, so uh, if you do a rename, uh, unlink, anything like that, uh, it's possible that uh, if the box crashes before uh, that data hits the disk, uh, you may, uh, that operation may turn out never to have happened, uh, even after you've returned back to user land. Now, it turns out in with most modern journal file systems, that's not such an issue. Uh, they, they almost all synchronously write to the journal before they'll return to user land. But, uh, you know, technically, you know, you're supposed to F-sync in order to do that, in order to uh, ensure that your operation persisted on disk. Um, I'm going to let you take this part. So this is a... Uh, <laughs> so uh, can you all hear me on this? I don't know if the mic's working. So. No? It's loud? <laughs> speak up. Okay, I'll try to speak up. That's hard for me. All right, so um, I get, you know, just to give you all an introduction to CephFS, for those of you who don't know, CephFS is a POSIX uh, distributed file system. It's the oldest storage um, application that's run on Ceph. It was the original use case for Ceph back in uh, around 2005. Uh, it's a cooperative file system with the clients. Um, in particular of note is that the clients have direct access to the uh, object storage devices. They're able to read and write all the the file data blocks um, themselves. They don't have to go through any kind of metadata server. So the server that Jeff was talking about um, earlier is actually the metadata server. So that is uh, the centralized services. There can be more than one that uh, 
uh, aggregate all the metadata mutations, journal them to uh, Rados in the metadata pool, and also serve to manage the cache between all the clients, making sure the clients are all uh, consistent and, uh, uh, and that the client's caches are also coherent. So there's um, uh, a capability mechanism that the MDS has uh, to give the clients rights to do things like read or write from a file or uh, keep track of what entries exist in a directory. And that's all cooperatively maintained by the clients and, and the MDSs. The clients are considered trusted in this FFS model, so they're not going to uh, misbehave in any way. Uh, because namely, they, they do have direct access to the data pool, but they're also expected to um, maintain their caches coherently with the MDS. Uh, so uh, Jeff's going to talk in particular um, in this talk, uh, focusing on these RPCs at the top between the client and the active metadata server. So, <coughs> so you know, how, how does the MDS manage all this, you know, mediate between the different clients? Well, it has this mechanism that we, it's called the CAP subsystem, it's short for capabilities. Um, and basically capabilities, if you're familiar with something like uh, NFS or SMB, is very similar to like a delegation or op lock. Uh, it's, uh, but they're more granular. Uh, in particular, they, they come in several different types of flavors. So we have a pin, auth, file, link, et cetera. And so they, you know, a lot of that sounds pretty obvious. Uh, you know, pin just ensures that the thing doesn't go away. Uh, and auth uh, ensures that, or pin actually ensures that it doesn't float between MDSs, I believe, actually. So, uh, so we ensure that the thing is pinned to a particular MDS while the operation is going on. Auth is, uh, covers uh, user, you know, ownership mode. Uh, file is a big cap. I'll talk about that in a minute. Link is uh, link count primarily, uh, and then X adder is uh, you know covers X adders. Uh, so they all have, pretty much all have a shared and exclusive variety. So we can hand out shared or exclusive caps to a to a client for them to to buffer operations or you know, cache operations. Uh, but the file caps are a little special. They have uh, a whole bunch of other different bits. And if you see down here, too, we can, you know, the way we express caps and track them in, the cur in, uh, in all the code is uh, via bit mask. And so this you know, part down here t is uh, more or less showing you sort of how the bits are laid out for the, for the different caps. Uh, the thing to notice about the file caps is that they are uh, pretty extensive. So we have, uh, we have you know, shared and exclusive, of course, but there's also um, uh, cache, uh, read write, buffer. Uh, I believe that one is an append. And then there's a uh, lazy IO, which is sort of a weirdo thing to, to allow it to uh, uh, not have to talk to the MDS so much. Um, but mostly here we're talking about directory operations. Uh, and so uh, traditionally the MDS has uh, not really given out much in the way of caps to the, to, for, on directories. So we will give out uh, shared caps pretty much, but uh, exclusive caps not so much. Uh, and then, uh, but so you know, in order to try to speed up asynchronous or as speed up directory operations, what we want to do is start uh, allowing the clients to do a bit more uh, locally. And so to do that, we have extended or, or over overloaded the uh, the file caps to have different meanings on directories. So in particular, uh, we want to allow create and unlink. Uh, those are the two that at least we're starting with. Uh, so basically, and we're also going to have the MDS uh, hand out uh, exclusive caps. So we, you'll notice too that we have sort of a shorthand notation here as well for, for how the caps uh, work, or how the caps are expressed. Um, so internally in the MDS, uh, we, uh, we've done, Typically, whenever we have to do a directory operation, the MDS has to go gather a bunch of locks um, between, you know, to, to ensure that other MDSs don't come in and try to do something. Uh, and so uh, Zhang, uh, sort of lead uh, developer on the MDS, uh, is, has uh, developed a new lock caching facility. So he can basically uh, have an MDS gather locks uh, for an operation on a directory uh, and then cache those for later use if he needs to do another. Um, so Essentially, what happens is we only uh, uh, hand these out, though, in, on the first uh, synchronous uh, uh, creator unlink in a directory. So now let's talk a little bit about dentry caching. So 
Uh, you know, again, we don't want to always have to do a synchronous round trip to the server to do a lookup or something like that for, uh, for a uh, directory entry. And when I, when I talk about dentry, what I'm talking about is a path name component uh, within, the, within the file system. So uh, uh, in order to do an asynchronous directory operation, we, have to, we need reliably, we need to know that our cached information about the directory is correct. Uh, we can't go and fire off an unlink and then find out later that, oh, that file didn't actually exist. <laughs> you know, so that's not allowed. So we have two mechanisms for tracking uh, dentries. We have a, uh, a dentry leases, uh, and we can they just come in positive or negative flavors. And then we also can hand out FS and, uh, by extension, uh, you know, share, uh, shared file caps on a directory or uh, exclusive caps on a directory, exclusive implied shared. And so for the latter, um, if, we, uh, if we just get the caps on the directory, we don't actually know anything about the dentries that are in it. So we have to either have done a read you know, full read on the directory, or we have to know, that the you know what the state of all the dentries in the direct is in the directory. So for instance, if we create a new directory, we know it's empty, uh, and we can consider it complete. And this allows us, so we do this, use this today, actually, uh, because this allows us to do uh, um, lookups, even negative lookups on a directory uh, in, without having to talk to the MDS. If we know that the state, that our information about the directory is complete and someone asks for some dentry that we know is not there, we don't have to talk to the MDS. We can just say, no, that doesn't exist. So, uh, so now let's talk about doing uh, actual asynchronous operations. So we'll start with talking about what, we, what happens today, right? You know, it's pretty, pretty typical, uh, similar to NFS or uh, SMD or anything like that. Uh, when we do an asynchronous, or you do a synchronous, someone calls unlink down into the kernel, for instance. Um, we do that synchronously. We uh, dispatch a, a call to the MDS. We have to wait for the reply to come in. And when the reply comes in, uh, then we can return back to user land. Um, but this is, can be really slow, right? I mean, if, think about it if doing like an rm-rf on a directory. You know, we're going to do a reader, find out what all is in there, and then we go issue an unlink on, all, on each file. And you know, each of those is a round trip. Uh, and so that slows, that's pretty, or very, very slow. So uh, in fact, here's a diagram that kind of shows the pr procedure for an asynchronous unlink. So we, here we have, uh, so we did an open on directory, right? So we get a, uh, and then that's going to do, you know, get information about the directory. We get capabilities for the directory. Let's say we've got, you know, exclusive caps. We do a read okay. to fill it, you know, to, so that we know what all the dentries are. Uh, and then we do uh, go back and, uh, you know, that gets reply, gets a reply. And then we do an unlink and then that comes back and then we do another unlink and that comes back and so on and so on and so forth. And then finally we can do an RM at the bottom. So, you know, if we're going to do these asynchronously, we have a decision to make. Uh, do we want to wait to transmit them, or do we want to uh, uh, just go ahead and fire them off as soon as we get them, right? And so it's natural to think about, uh, the, uh, when you're talking about asynchronous operations, it's natural to think about, uh, like, buffered I.O. in the kernel. Uh, in that case, we are writing to a cache, you know, page cache in the kernel, and then eventually we flush that out. And so the, the deal with the kernel, with writes, though, is that anytime you do a write in the kernel, there's a pretty high probability that, you know, that there will be a follow-on write a little later that may also modify that data. So often it's uh, advantageous to wait a while to, before you flush these things out. Uh, not so much on directories. Uh, you know, operate, you know, workloads that uh, repeatedly create and unlink the same entries are pretty rare. So, you know, at least the, at this point we're operating under the assumption that there's not a lot to be gained by delaying them. Uh, and so as soon as someone calls this, we're just going to go ahead and fire off the call, and then we just won't wait on the reply. Uh, we may change this in the future. There are some workloads, things like um, uh, rsync, uh, do, do, uh, uh, will often uh, copy, a, you know, create a file, write to it, and then rename it into place. Uh, that may be more advantageous to, to do that. Can, can I uh, wait until the end? So, okay. <laughs> so um, that may be more advantageous to, to uh, so we may, you know, in the future, consider doing this differently. So an asynchronous unlink. So how do we do this, right? So first of all, we have to get, uh, you know, exclusive caps on the directory. 
and we also need an unlink cap, which typically means that we have to have done a, a synchronous unlink in the directory first. Uh, we also need to know that the denture is positive, right? So we have to know that the file exists. Uh, and then also we, there's also a, a concept in Ceph, it's sort of exclusive to Ceph, that uh, it has to be the primary denture for, a, uh, for, a, for the file. Uh, Ceph has, has a really strange way of tracking hard-linked files, and so uh, we exclude, basically you're excluding hard-linked files from this, at least for the time being. So the idea here is that we're going to fire off the unlinked call to the MDS, uh, and then we're just going to assume that it worked, right? Uh, and then not wait on the reply. So we can fire the thing off. We go ahead and uh, de-delete the entry inside the kernel, uh, and then we return back to user land. Um, you know, the upshot of that is that if we are doing a whole bunch of these, uh, we are shoveling them all out in parallel, and that really can speed up, uh, you know, like removing a directory recursively. So here's, a, here's our diagram again. Pretty much all the same up here, uh, but down here you can see we're, we're firing off lots of un, you know, async unlink requests, and then they come back. And then we eventually, once, we've, you know, once all the replies have come in, we can go ahead and issue the, the, uh, an RMD request to remove the directory. So Again, this is real bleeding edge work, so you know, <laughs> these numbers may change in the future. But for now, I, you know, I just did some real basic testing on a virtualized uh, test environment on my home machine. Uh, and so I basically created 10,000 files in a directory. So, and, and I should say, say here too, when, when we did started this work, we started with unlink because it's easier. <laughs> Creates are you know, uh, quite a bit harder, and I'll go into why that is later. But so, um, here you can see if we just remove all the files in that directory, if we have to wait and do them all synchronously, it took about 10 seconds on this box. Uh, but with asynchronous durops, less than a second. Uh, the catch is that the, uh, we have to wait uh, for all the replies to come in before we can issue the rmdir. So again, here I'm just removing all the files in the directory. I didn't actually remove the directory itself. If you go and remove the directory itself, you, you, you'll find that it blocks for a while. Um, you know. It's still faster uh, than the async or than the sync uh, synchronous case because you're not waiting for uh, because we're issuing all these unlinks in parallel. Uh, but it uh, it does. Uh, but you do notice a delay on the RMDR part. And <clears throat> here's some more numbers. Um, so these are uh, um, histograms that I created with BPF. If you've not used BPF in the uh, yet, it, you should. It's awesome. Um, but it, uh, so you can see here, these are, this is the time spent in Ceph Unlink, and this, these are in Jiffies, which is a millisecond. Uh, and so uh, here you can see synchronously uh, that these are all quite slow, right? You know, we're, this, the fastest one is still 512,000 mil, you know, milliseconds. Over here, we're down to 1,000, you know, 1,000, 2,000. Uh, and, and you can see down here, there's one outlier right here, you know, that's probably. Uh, you know, and some of them are still outliers. Uh, I haven't gone to go figure out why some of them are not going as, as fast. I think occasionally we get a situation where they go synchronous. Uh, and again, we have to do at least one, one synchronous remove in the directory too, or one synchronous unlink in the directory before we can uh, do an async one. Um, Jeff, I, oh, sure. I think those are actually microseconds. Uh, so the uh, no, on the right side, I thought it was 1,000 microseconds. I did these in jiffies, so, jiffies. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I, I'll have to go back and look. Maybe I've got it. Maybe I'm off by a factor of 1,000, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe you're right. <laughs> okay. I, I stand corrected. I did do it in jiffies, though. Um, the, uh, so... Um, we have some opportunities to improve that, improve this uh, situation too, right? Uh, right now we're not doing, uh, we're doing synchronous RMDR, uh, but we may consider doing that asynchronously in the future. Um, you know, again, too, uh, you know, uh, what I find, you know, in certain cases is that, you know, like we, like I said, we have some outliers here, and I think what happens is, occasionally we end up doing something synchronously, and then those operations get backed up behind the pile of. Async operations that are in, in flight. 
Uh, so we probably have some, may need to consider doing some throttling on this. Uh, and then also we can consider batching up uh, the uh, unlink operations as well. So that we, so that we can just, uh, you know, if we could batch a bunch of them up, fire them all off it in, in a single call, that might be more efficient. I'm, I'm not convinced on this. Uh, the lock caching thing that Zhang has put in is, uh, seems to me that that's where the most of the slowdown would be. Uh, so I'm, I'm suspecting that that may not be as, as useful, but we may experiment with it and find out. If, if there is a benefit, it's probably with the MDS journaling. We, would, we might expect to see the, the MDS can write the operations to the journal more efficiently. That's a good point, yeah. So, um, OK, now let's talk about async create. So uh, if we do, uh, so the requirements for an async create, uh, we need uh, DX and DC caps. And again, we've overloaded the file cache cap for this. Uh, we also need a known negative entry in this case. Of course, because if there's already a file there, we can't do a create on top of it. Uh, and we, so we need uh, a neg either a negative dent release on the thing, or we need, uh, you know, we already have DS on the parent directory by virtue of the fact that we have DX, uh, but we need completeness uh, otherwise if we don't have the lease. Uh, we also need a file layout. So like uh, Patrick pointed out, file data goes through uh, directly to the OSDs. The clients need to know where to write that data. Uh, and so the file layout is what, uh, is what tells them that. When we do that first synchronous create in a directory, uh, then we copy that file layout because we know that any uh, new file created in a, in a directory will inherit the file layout from the parent. And then we also need a uh, delegated inode number. Uh, whenever you do a create, you know, we're creating an inode, uh, we're creating a dentry. Uh, that inode, uh, but we need to know what that inode number is. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. So again, we just fire off the create call immediately. Uh, we set up the new inode, plug it into the entry, and, and move on and return from the open. Uh, and we always assume that a newly created inode gets a full set of caps because we want the, uh, we know that the, typically whenever the, you do a synchronous create even, you, on a new file, we get back a full set of caps on it. Uh, and we always set O exclusive in the call just because there should be there should be no reason that we can't. Uh, you know, if the file's not there, uh, if the file turns out to be there, we want it to error out. We don't want to over, you know open the file and screw that up. So inode number delegation. So in order to uh, we need to know in advance what the inode number is going to be whenever we create this new inode. So we have to ha that's in order to a hash it properly in the kernel so we can find it later and also to allow for uh, writes onto the, into the file before the open reply comes back. Uh, so we hand out ranges of item numbers and then create responses now. So whenever a, uh, uh, we do a synchronous create, that first synchronous create, uh, the uh, MDS will shovel out a pile of item numbers to the client, and then it can go and use those. I mean, so we have a new tunable in, in the user land MDS now uh, to, uh, the MDS also pre-allocates inodes for a particular client on, and attaches it to its session. Uh, and so what we're doing is just delegating a pile of those to the client for use. Uh, so this is tied currently to the MDS session. Uh, I think we need some work in this area still. Uh, the, right now, if you lose the session, then the, the inodes go away, and it's not clear to me how we're going to uh, handle case where we've like already fired off a request and it didn't work. So error handling on this is all still a little bit sketchy. So let's talk about performance. Um, again, uh, we're going to we're creating 10,000 files in a directory here. So I'm doing a very simple you know, shell script loop uh, to just write to uh, all these files. So without async direct directory operations, it takes about 11 seconds on this box. Uh, with it, about half. So a, a slight improvement. <laughs> uh, again, histograms. Um, Again, if you see this with BPF, you'll see like the nice bars out, by the, you know, text text bars, but out the side. But I've chopped those off here just because I don't have, uh, I didn't have room on the slide. But here you can see, uh, you know, these are all quite slow uh, up here. You know, most of them are in this this range right here. You know, five twelve k to one million. Uh, but over here with async durops, we can, you know, we're down into the you know thousands. Uh, we do have some outliers here. Again, I, I think with what's happening in that case, I, again, I need to go do some analysis to figure out why. But I think the situation there is that we get to a situation where we run out of inode numbers. And uh, so 
it, when that happens, the client has to go synchronous. And some of these calls end up backed up behind some of the previous async calls. And then they take a long time to come back. So we probably have some work to do here, too, again, with throttling. The all-important kernel build test. Um, so I just did a, you know, built a, you know, made a little Linux tarball, uh, make a directory, uh, CD into it, untar it, and make, it, make the thing. Uh, so here, just about five minutes to do the build. Uh, with async durops, we shave about 50 seconds off. It's about a 20% improvement, not bad. So again, opportunities we can to improve this would be uh, we could do uh, allow for in-place renames. Uh, you know, again, we may need to make an asynchronous rename. Uh, we need to. Uh, uh, we could also batch creates as well uh, if we buffer them for a little while. We don't necessarily have to fire them off immediately. Uh, and then we could also do other operations, uh, make dir, symlink, uh, stuff like that would be kind of nice to add probably. And of course, of course, error handling, which is the bugaboo for this whole thing. So if we return early, right, error handling is where, the, where this is all uh, iffy. So if we return early from an unlink or an open, and what do we do if these fail, right? I mean, that's the big question. Uh, for creates, we've already closed, we could have already closed the file by the time the reply come in. I mean, we could have written, written a, if there are small files in particular, we could have opened them, uh, written to them, closed them, and then all of a sudden the create reply comes in and we find out it didn't work for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure which failures are permitted by the protocol. I'm not sure. No, I think Patrick put that in. You want to mention what that was about? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, so, I, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, different types of failures for an un unlink or open that could happen. And um, part of the challenge with doing an asynchronous create or unlink is identifying what failures entirely are the responsible of the, the client and you would not um, it would not be permitted for the MDS to give you those failures as part of the asynchronous call versus um, failures that may occur at the MDS, for example, Eno space, um, which the kernel client would need to handle somehow. Um, Eno space actually in practice for metadata mutations just doesn't happen in Ceph unless you have a catastrophically uh, out of space Ceph cluster, in which case you have many other problems. Um, but there's probably not very many uh, failures that uh, the kernel client can't actually handle itself, so, but we still need to go through all the different cases there and make sure we're not missing anything. That's basically, I think, what that bullet point's for. Okay. So again, I, you know, when I started this work, you know, I kind of hung the whole thing on this, <laughs> on this paragraph, right? That comes out of the fsync man page, right? And basically, it just says, calling fsync does not necessarily ensure that the entry in the directory containing the file has also reached the disk. For that, an explicit fsync on the file descriptor for the directory is also needed. So, you know, the upshot being that if you don't, that when you write a file or create a file and write to it, uh, you also need to f-sync on the directory, too, to ensure that the dentry actually made it to disk. Uh, in practice, uh, most file systems nowadays, you don't need to do that anymore. Uh, this is, was written, I believe, when, you know, ext2 was prevalent. Uh, and so, uh, you know, nowadays, the, uh, almost all modern file systems journal to create before they return back to user land. And so if the box crashes and comes back or whatever, uh, it, the file will certainly exist. Just to add on to that, um, you still see the the remnants of uh, very cautious um, applications that are written to fsync on the database, namely um, SQLite, which actually has some very excellent documentation for the entire rigmarole process of uh, synchronously writing the database correctly such that it will survive any kind of uh, crash or, or uh, machine failure. So the, they they did they do actually do the the f sync on the directory file descriptor, but you'll see it, as many de especially kernel developers bemoan you know it's actually fairly rare for applications to use f sync correctly. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, in most cases, f syncing on the directory is not usually you know it's usually pretty quick because there's not much to be written back. Um, but here, at least in this implementation too, you know, if you do an f-sync on the directory, we will wait for all the buffered, uh, or wait for all the async operations to come back. Uh, so you can, we can use that as a barrier to ensure that things actually did hit the MDS and do the right thing. So more, more about error handling. Um, so currently after failed unlink, what we do is uh, we just, um, 
we mark the directory non-complete because we don't know what the heck happened, right? Uh, we invalidate the dentry that was that was there and so to force the, uh, the client to have to do a new lookup. And then we set a write back error on the parent directory to show up so that if you do that F sync, you'll get an error back. Uh, after fail create, we again validate the dentry. Uh, we should also mark it non complete. Uh, set writable, and we set a write back error on the parent directory again, and we set a write back error on the created inode. Um, so, you know, this is an area where I'm still exploring, you know, what we should do. Um, so one idea might be to propagate errors uh, all the way back up to the top of the mount so that you could potentially open like a high level directory, uh, call an f-sync on that, uh, and then find out and then get an error back. And then if you see that error, then you know uh, something failed down below. In, in the modern world where we're doing a lot of stuff in containers, spinning up temporary containers to do builds and stuff like that, that may be sufficient, right? You know, if you if it falls over, if something fall, fell over during the build, you can just throw that build away and start again, right? Uh, and we may need to consider new interfaces. Oh, oh another idea might be to use SyncFS. Uh, SyncFS in the kernel is pr has pretty lousy error handling right now. Uh, it, basically, the only error you can reliably get back from SyncFS is uh, ebadf, so if you pass it a bad file descriptor. Uh, but we could use that as well. And that's it. Uh, questions? <laughs> Jeremy, you had a question earlier. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so Mike, you kind of answered that later on, but I was wondering if the Ceph protocol had the equivalent of the asynchronous, uh, the thing with SMB, where you would basically chain operations together. We have an asynchronous open with delete and close marked, and then a close. So you chain the things together no. And then you can issue those asynchronously or together in one RPC, and, and basically the server then processes them in whatever order it wants, and you're just waiting for them to come back. Yeah, yeah, we don't do compounding. Okay. So More's compound. the pity. Yeah, <laughs> compounding, I mean, there might be a future enhancement. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to see that. Uh, it makes a know, great difference. Ceph wasn't designed with that from the get-go, yeah. and so it doesn't happen. I mean, especially as if you're doing a lot, an open lot of operations close, the, the ability to implicitly just sequence all those and use the file description implicitly from the open is very powerful. Yeah, yeah, we, I'd love to have that. We don't have it right today. Yeah. So, any other questions? Um, we're working on an open source backup software named Barrios and... I'm, I'm sorry, can, can you, you speak me? up a little? Pardon? Oh, can you speak up a little? Okay. okay. Um, we, are, we are making an open source backup software named Barrios and um, I hope this question isn't too off topic. Um, GlusterFS has something named GlusterFind, which can uh, give us a list of files and directories changed since a certain point in time. Does uh, Ceph have, CephFS have anything like that? Not that I'm aware of. Anybody? Or Any, Greg, you may, Greg, you may know, like so or, or Patrick. Okay, okay yeah. <laughs> so Ceph has, uh, CephFS has this concept of recursive statistics, which um, one oh, of the... True. So, which is like uh, stats on an inode, except it's, it's recursive in nature. So like you can do figure out how many um, uh, hierarchically how many files are under a directory tree by just doing uh, looking at a sp specific extended stat attribute of the of the directory. One of those things you can look at is the version of the files. So you can actually see that, um, and that trickles up all the way to the root. So if uh, you know a file has been changed recently, that goes, you can look at the recursive st statistics of the directory. Um, to see that something under it's changed and just keep going down and looking, examining the files. Um, it's not quite as efficient as the cluster FS where, you know, you can get the entire diff and all, let's see all the files, but you can, the mechanism is there to actually do it yourself. Um, although in the future we do want to make it simpler by um, building support of like cluster FS and the CFS and making it a first class citizen of a file system. So not quite, but you could do it yourself if you want. Any other questions? Jeremy again? <laughs> so for returning errors, I thought that was interesting. The only errors I can see other than sort of like the remote disk died are as if someone does a rename of the directory out from under you or if someone changes the permissions on the directory so that your operations would get access denied. I'm assuming that you would get a lease on the directory first such that 
but they would be blocked or you would get a pending notification before that that's how you would handle that right right that's what those caps are all about they're like a, they're kind of similar to an op lock release yeah i just don't part of the metadata but the but yes uh it, n that would not be allowed while we had exclusive caps on the directory okay. um, and you can't do this unless you do so got it okay got it. thanks any other questions so just to add on to that, the, the, one of the re we didn't really um, get into this in too much detail, but one of the, you heard Jeff several times said, uh, you know, the first synchronous create or the first synchronous unlink. The, in it, our diagram was actually a, a, a bit wrong on that um, that we showed. There, not all of the unlink requests are completely asynchronous. The first one has to be <coughs> synchronous, and that's just so that the MDS can acquire all the necessary locks and also issue any necessary capabilities so that you can do any further unlinks yourself. So that first request is actually synchronous. And one of the reasons for that is you need to get the, the file layout for the, the create, which um, lets you know how to actually stripe the data blocks across multiple objects for the, uh, the new file. Um, and then also ensures that the MDA, that the because file layouts can also be set hierarchically on a subtree, that you know that nothing, no directory above you has had its file layout changed such that the file layout on a new uh, file should be uh, something else so the client can safely move forward knowing that the file layout hasn't been changed um, out from under it by, by operations on a, on a higher level directory. And all that's protected by the, the caps that the MDS is issuing. Any other questions? So this is all still experimental, um, but part of it is already in um, in the code. Um, so when will this be available? Will this be uh, 16 or uh, uh, the next release? Is that back not upcoming, but the one after? Or is it a, like a multi-gear effort? Uh, I think the user land part of it, the MDS part, is in. We had to get that part in before we could even figure out whether this was going to be worthwhile, right? <laughs> and so uh, we've got that part in for, uh, mostly. I think it is worthwhile. We're going to keep pursuing it. Um, the kernel bits, I have, I mean, I have prototype code, of course, that works, uh, but it has some rough edges. Um, I, it won't make this merge window. Uh, so, you know, 5 7 would be the absolute earliest in the kernel part. Um, but probably later. Uh, I have a feeling I'm going to probably want to do a cleanup of the syncfs code in the kernel, and then turn around and and maybe plumb the error. You know, have that use that for the error handling. Or, you know, or recommend that we use that for the error handling. Um, and that probably will be a bit of an effort because uh, the syncfs code needs some work. So, okay. Two more minutes. Any other questions? Just to add on to the answer to that question, um, so the MDS bits are actually going to be in Octopus, which will be released in uh, March. So um, all the, the groundwork is there. Um, the the Step Fuse client um, probably won't have support until the P release, which we're calling Pacific, so in 2021. Uh, that'll be available. But the kernel client, I think, which is getting most of our focus right now, should you know, hopefully we'll have um, something merged into mainline within a few months, you know, assuming everything's going as we expect. You know, yeah, no yeah. I, I think the unlinked code probably can go in fairly soon. I'm, I'm, I almost merged it, I almost had them merge it for this coming merge window, uh, but I decided to wait uh, because I'm going to have to rework some of the underlying code for, um, for the creates to be better. And I wasn't comfortable merging the unlinked part until I felt better about what you know what that part would look like so I, I it's not quite there yet but maybe latter part of this year at, you know but uh, I, I, my guess is that we'll probably have something in before too long and this will probably be like an optional feature too uh, we ha right now I've got it set on a module parameter uh, but we may eventually uh, you know make it a mount option or something like that so okay, okay. I think we're out of time now so if you haven't got the questions let me know <laughs> Thank you.